Hello there. What do you know about Beta Ray Bill? Would you like to know more? I'm Big Anklevich, podcaster, author, and toy enthusiast, and today we're talking about another release from Marvel Legends, the Professor Hulk wave Beta Ray Bill, here on Big Anklevich on Toys. Can you pay my bills? Can you pay my telephone bills? Can you pay my automobiles? Have you heard of Beta Ray Bill? He's got a kooky name, he's weird looking, and he's also relatively obscure. I had never even heard of the guy before Toy Biz put out a Marvel Legends figure of him back in 2006. My podcast co-host Rish Outfield, who has always been my go-to source, my comic nerd oracle, told me Bill's story. And I have to say, I became enamored with the guy. Oh, not Rish, I mean Beta Ray Bill. I became further enamored when I saw the 2012 episode of Avengers, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, called The Ballad of Beta Ray Bill. I have to say, I loved the story idea. Now Hasbro put out their version of Bill, and I decided that I would most definitely make him mine. While I looked for him, though, I thought it would be interesting to see if I could go back and read the original comic books in which he made his first appearance. He was created by Walt Simonson in the November 1983 issue of Thor, number 337. What he did in the story was something that hadn't been done before, though recently it's becoming more common. This story takes place back in the day when Thor still had his Donald Blake secret identity going on. When he wasn't the mighty Thor, he was frail Dr. Donald Blake, who walked with a cane that had secret properties. If he tapped the cane, it transformed into Mjolnir, and Donald Blake became the mighty Thor, god of thunder and prince of Asgard. To start out the tale, S.H.I.E.L.D. abducts Donald Blake from a park in Chicago. Nick Fury reveals to Blake that he knows who he really is. They want his help because something is headed our way. An alien fleet led by a ship that appears to have destroyed stars on its way toward us. Thor flies through space at light speed, or beyond that actually, I guess, and finds the ship. The ship, whose name is Scuttlebutt, yeah, that's what they went with, welcomes Thor with guns blazing. The guns aren't enough to take out a god, however, and Thor rips his way into the ship, where he is met by a fearsome enemy, and they battle to a standstill. Thor is amazed that this monstrous creature can give him such a hard time. What manner of being is this who so cavalierly tosses the god of thunder about like a bale of new mown hay? He wonders. Rise up, demon. You have pursued me only to find death. And when I am through with you, you will welcome it. I am called Bill. Beta Ray Bill, he defiantly shouts. And again... That's what they went with. For some reason, Walt Simonson wanted his hideous monster to have a run-of-the-mill name. He was going to go with Beta Ray Jones, but he said there were already too many Joneses in Marvel. The Beta Ray part was to give him a dollop of good sci-fi flavor, but Bill? The guy's an alien, right? That's never made much sense to me, despite how much I like him. Also, even though he designed Bill to be monstrous looking, he also chose a horse skull as the basis of the face design because he considered horses to be among the most noble animals, so it could give you clues as to Bill's true character. The damage done to Scuttlebutt in the fight is so great that it prompts the ship to find a place where it can acquire materials to fix itself. Oh look! Here's a nice solar system whose third planet would do nicely. So, the ship crash lands on Earth. When they get close enough to Earth, Thor's Donald Blake enchantment kicks back in. If he doesn't touch his hammer for more than one minute, he turns back into Donald Blake. This transformation takes place at just the wrong time, and Thor is rendered helpless before Beta Ray Bill, who promptly knocks him out cold. Bill has seen just how powerful a weapon Thor's hammer is, so he goes to take it for himself, but can't find it. It's gone. Only this stick is where it once was. But he taps the stick against the wall and with a flash of light, suddenly he is holding Thor's hammer. And wearing his duds too. This was a pretty monumental moment in Thor's history. 
As I said, it's becoming all too common for someone else to be worthy to bear Mjolnir, but up until Beta Ray Bill took it up in this story, it hadn't been done before. Others had lifted it, but no others had been worthy to wield it. The hammer has the inscription on the side that says, Whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. It seems obvious that this day would come sooner or later with vague language like that in the inscription, but I think that the folks at Marvel always meant it to mean that Thor had to be worthy to have his power. And if he wasn't, he couldn't lift it. Later in the next issue, Odin says that he never expected this to happen, and that up until now no one else had been worthy to wield the hammer and possess its power. But here we have it. A worthy warrior had come. And what made him worthy? Well, I like this quote from Walt Simonson during a panel at the 2010 Baltimore Comic Con where he explained it. This is the most powerful weapon of the Norse gods. This hammer is a killing weapon. It's used to kill frost giants and others. So Superman couldn't pick it up because he's never going to kill anyone. And the hammer knows that. Captain America, he's too patriotic. He's too much a symbol of America to be chosen by this Norse artifact. So he couldn't get it. So I created Bill because he's noble and he's designed to kill. He's got a great purpose as a warrior and also the noble ability. That makes him worthy, whatever that may be. I really like this explanation. I've always wondered what made Thor so worthy when others were not. Like this scene in Age of Ultron, Cap manages to wiggle the hammer a little bit and Thor is taken aback to see it. When I saw that, I could only think, but Captain America is probably much more pure and good-hearted and worthy than Thor will ever be. So I guess now we know why it didn't work. Although it eventually did. And in the years since this story, several people in the comics have wielded Mjolnir including Captain America, as well as Superman and Wonder Woman in DC Marvel crossover storylines. Those folks do make sense, though, as they are among the most true blue, noble, black and white, without any gray areas characters out there. Okay, back to the story. Shields show up at the crash site of Scuttlebutt. Uh, yeah, remember, that's the name of the ship. And they are violently met by Beta Ray Bill and his newly acquired hammer. But everything is brought to a halt when Odin appears in the sky and transports Thor back to Asgard. Except, he didn't look closely enough at who he'd grabbed and, in fact, brought Beta Ray Bill back instead. Thor wakes up and freaks out because he is afraid that he is stranded on Earth with no way to become Thor again and return to Asgard. He isn't sure if Odin can find him and bring him back and he cries to the heavens for Odin to save him. Then we start issue 338. In Asgard, Odin quickly realizes something has gone wrong when Beta Ray Bill materializes and immediately starts attacking all the demons he has encountered there. Odin quickly puts a stop to the fight. Time out! Odin sees where he went wrong just grabbing the bright spark of Thor's power when he transported Bill to Asgard rather than making sure that Thor himself was the one wielding the power because no one else ever has, after all. Bill also realizes his mistake. These are not demons. They're all loving and full of familial care and stuff, and demons don't do that. Odin transports the actual Thor to Asgard, and then Bill tells them all his backstory. Bill's race is called the Corbinites. They were an advanced race, and as he says, built our cities in the burning skies and danced in the sunlight. Something happened, however, that we'll find out in later Thor comics, to destroy the core of their galaxy. The Corbinites had to flee their world in search of a new home. They filled ships with their people in suspended animation and chose Bill to be the guardian of the Exodus. Bill underwent bioengineering to make him powerful enough that he could defeat any threat. They combined him with the most ferocious carnivore of their world and he became what he was. Bill, Scuttlebutt, and that's the intelligent warship that he rides in, and the rest of the fleet of transport ships headed out. And they were immediately set upon by a horde of demons and have been fighting for their lives against them ever since. 
Bill has Mjolnir and doesn't want to give it up because it is such a powerful weapon and it would help him beat the demons. Odin, being the great father that he is, proposes that Bill and Thor fight to the death and the winner gets to keep the hammer. I love Odin. I actually model all my parenting after him. A few months ago, my seven-year-old son and his friend were fighting over who got to play with the Emmet Lego minifigure. And I had them fight to the death and whoever remained got to play with the minifigure. <laughs> Luckily, my son won this time. So thanks, Odin, for the advice. So Odin sends them both to Skartheim to fight. It's a volcanic planet filled with lava and eruptions and all that. They fight viciously for panel after panel until they eventually both lay, passed out, exhausted on a rock that is floating down a river of lava about to plunge over a lava waterfall. The floor is lava! Get off! Bill, however, wakes up first because the heat works together with his engineered physiology. He's about to jump off the rock and escape and win the battle, but can't do it. He feels bad about leaving his brave and worthy foe behind to die so ignominiously, so he grabs Thor and leaps to safety. So the defeated Thor lives, but Beta Ray Bill can now claim the hammer. Now we move to issue 339. Bill doesn't feel right about claiming the hammer. He feels the fight wasn't totally fair. He had the advantage of the heat working with his physiology. He needs the hammer to help his people escape the demons, but he doesn't feel like it really belongs to him. He asks Odin to help, and Odin decides to create a new weapon just like Mjolnir for Bill. He asks the dwarves who made Mjolnir to make a new hammer, and they say they will if Odin sends a woman to defeat their champion. Has to be a woman, though. Lady Sif is, of course, the one they send, for she is their greatest female warrior. She travels to the dwarves, is set upon by their champion, and defeats him. Turns out the dwarves were using Odin, and by extension Lady Sif, to solve their problems for them. This dwarf wasn't really their champion, but rather a bully that has been lording it over all of them, oppressing them greatly. They knew that if he was defeated by a woman, then he would be too embarrassed to ever come back and show his face around them again. That's why they wanted a female warrior to come. It was 1983 when this was published, folks. Times have changed since then, but outdated attitudes are going to be present still in old fiction. The overall story is still good, so I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The outdated attitudes seem to belong solely to the dwarves as well, because Asgard has no problem having Sif as a great warrior in their midst, and this won't be the end to her part in the story as well. The dwarves, thankful for Sif's help, get right to work forging another hammer. Bada boom! He's got his hammer. Bada boom. Big. Big. Yeah, big bada boom. Big. Bada big boom. This new hammer is called Stormbreaker. Sound familiar? Yeah, that's the name of the new hammer slash axe that Thor forges in the Avengers Infinity War movie to replace Mjolnir after Hela destroyed it in Thor Ragnarok. In the comics, that was Beta Ray Bill's hammer. Odin tells them that they have to hurry. He's seen the plight of the Corbinite ships. They're being attacked by the demons as we speak. So Thor, Bill, and Lady Sif get on a little chariot pulled by some gnarly goats named Tooth Nasher and Tooth Grinder and set out at beyond light speed for the battle. Yeah, the goats go that fast. I did tell you they were gnarly, right? They run through space, too. Look at these things. You wish you had transportation like that. They arrive at the fleet of Corbinite ships to find that the demons have already caught up with it. The last ship in the line is destroyed by the demons just as Thor, Bill, and Sif arrive. Thor promises to avenge them. If we can't protect the Earth, you can be damn well sure we'll avenge it. Sif jumps out to take on the demons that have already made it this far, and tells Bill and Thor to keep going, get to the source of the demons, and get the spigot shut off. They keep going and find the portal where the hordes of demons are flowing from. The demons swarm them, but they fight them off. Meanwhile, Sif is about to be completely overwhelmed by the demons. She's killed so many of them that her sword is dripping with gore, but they keep coming. She defiantly shouts at the wave of monsters descending upon her, ready to make that valiant, suicidal last stand when... Ba-doom, ba-doom! Scuttlebutt arrives from Earth, repaired and ready to join the fight as well. 
when they realize that the demons are determined to destroy them and that they have forgotten about the fleet of cold sleeping Corbinites, they fly off into space to lead them away. Back up the line, Thor and Beta Ray Bill realize that there is no way that they will be able to destroy the source of all these swarming demons, so they decide to simply try to close the portal instead. How is that done? They each stand on one side of the portal and hurl their hammers together so that they meet with a crash in the middle. They come together with a mighty Baraham. At that same moment, Sif and Scuttlebutt see there is no way to continue the fight, and Scuttlebutt decides to destroy itself, because that process would destroy everything in that sector of space, taking as many demons as possible with them. Sif chooses to stay and die together with the noble ship, and the countdown begins. And, of course, at one, they notice the demons are suddenly disappearing. The self-destruct is cancelled because Thor and Bill have won, and therefore so have Sif and Scuttlebutt. Thor and Bill, Sif and Scuttlebutt return to Asgard, and they have a huge celebration feast. Even after his great victory and the ensuring of a future for his people, Bill is melancholy. He feels sad about leaving Asgard because everyone there has been so friendly and accepting of him. His own people find this monstrous form that he has taken to be able to be their champion to be so ugly and scary that they don't like to be around him. Sif relates this tale to Odin, which she learned from Scuttlebutt on their journey back to Asgard. And then, at the celebration feast, Odin grants both Thor and Bill a boon, whatever thing it is that they both need most. Afterward, Bill takes his hammer, Stormbreaker, and strikes it on the ground, and he is transformed back to his original Corbinite form. And Thor, now, no longer has the enchantment that will transform him into Donald Blake. It's gone, transferred to Beta Ray Bill instead. Bill is so grateful that he will be able to live a normal life again when he and his people find a new planet to make their home. And Thor... Well, he's going to have to figure out how to be a superhero down on Earth, uh, on Midgard, without his secret identity. And that, my dear lords and ladies, is the Ballad of Beta Ray Bill. It's a great story that teaches a great lesson. Beta Ray Bill is a hideously ugly monster, so he must be dangerous and a huge threat, right? Simonson said, I deliberately wrote them so you weren't sure in the beginning if he was a good guy or a bad guy. If you're not sure, then you'll go with your first impression, right? He's ugly, therefore bad. Simonson said, I designed Bill deliberately as a monster because I knew that people would look at it and go, Oh my god, it's this evil guy! Then we discover that no, Bill is as noble as they come. He's frightening and powerful, but his motives are pure and good. He's worthy to take the hammer of Thor and wield it in his battle for this honorable cause. We've heard the lesson so many times. Where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. This is just another version for us, another way to teach that old lesson to kids today, or kids of 1983, I mean. Sadly, Avengers Endgame probably made Beta Ray Bill's story moot in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, spoiler alert for the one person who still hasn't seen Endgame, don't watch this next clip. We'll never see a movie version of Beta Ray Bill's story after Captain America totally stole his thunder. No pun intended. Oh, who am I kidding? I totally meant to do that pun. Please forgive me. Oh, not only that, but also... So there may be no way to make you trust me. But we need to go. Right. Yeah, it's not really a big deal anymore, is it? And that's too bad, because I really like the Ballad of Beta Ray Bill, and I would enjoy a movie made about it. But, you know, 
Recently, I've come to realize that movies and TV shows aren't everything. They don't make a story better or more important. We have the ballad of Beta Ray Bill right here in the pages of Marvel Comics, and that's as good as any other source. It's good enough of a source that Hasbro is now releasing their version of Bill's action figure. Let's take a look at that now. What say you, gallant warriors of the realm? Here he is in the box. Nice looking package if you're into that stuff. Some beautiful art on the box, but I'm not a box saver, so let's rip this open. This is a much more modern version of Beta Ray Bill than the old Toy Biz version. His costume is still Thor inspired, but now it's all black with just the small chest plate of beaten steel. The color scheme reminds me of this Thor that I've had on my Avengers shelf for a while. All black and silver, like a Raiders fan or something. I think I'm going to be replacing him with the 80th anniversary Thor that just came out though. I think I might like that classic look a little better. I do like that Bill has the elevated cape. It's plastic, so if you're one of those that likes the posability of cloth goods, you won't appreciate this much. If you're like me, however, and want it to look as realistic as possible, then it'll work great for you. It's got great sculpting and detail. It also has a peg that you can insert into his back to keep it in place, or pull out and set it against his back to give the cape added lift. Bill's monstrously ugly dinosaur horse face has a hinged jaw, so you can make him look as fierce as possible. I like this a lot. Marvel Legends doesn't get much call for hinged jaws. You get creatures in Star Wars that do well with hinged jaws much more often. So it's cool to see Hasbro incorporate that into a Marvel Legends figure when it can. Bill's hammer, Stormbreaker, is well sculpted, but I wish that it had a little more, or any, I guess is the actual right word, detail in the paint. It's just cast in gold plastic. It's shiny and nice, but at the very least, it would be cool to see a wash in the handle or something. I'll probably add one in myself because, well, because I'm like that. His hands are both open so that he can hold the hammer, but this one is more open than the other. It doesn't hold the shaft tightly. It seems like it's meant to be more the backhand of the two-handed grip. You can bring his hands all the way together if your pose calls for it, and that's pretty cool. And he's got the usual Marvel Legends pose ability, so you can get him into some pretty fun poses. So there you go, the new Beta Ray Bill figure, and his first appearance in comics all the way back in 1983. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe, and hey, share this video around with your friends if you would. If you like it, let somebody else know that it exists too, and that would really help my channel grow. See you next time, and thanks for watching. Big Anklevich on Toys.